Hello, I'm Journey McBride and I'm the Associate Director of Development for the UCR Library. I would like to welcome you all today to the library's Faculty Profiles in Research, Art, and Innovation series. Today, we are featuring Stu Krieger, who will read from his debut novel titled That One Cigarette. This event is being recorded and the replay will be available within 48 hours on the library's website. Now at this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Professor Erith Jaffrey Berg. She is a professor of theater within the Department of Theater, Film and Digital Production right here at UC Riverside. Her research focuses on the Commedia dell'arte and performances by minority groups in early modern Italy. Thank you so much, Janine. Thank you for that. Uh, so I'm just um, restating a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, again, just to remind you that the webinar will be recorded and that once we come to questions, we ask that you ask your questions in chat only, not um, in a Q&A as we're in remote mode. So first of all, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, you to my friend and colleague, Stu Krieger. Stu is a man of many achievements, but not least of these achievements is that he models for us as colleagues what life work balance looks like. And for that, I am so very grateful to Stu. Stu has been a professor of screen and television writing in the University of California, Riverside's Department of Theater, Film and Digital Production since 2006. He also teaches one class per year at the USC Peter Stark MFA producing program. Uh, Stu co-wrote the Emmy winning miniseries, A Year in the Life, and he was nominated for a Humanitas Prize for the Disney Channel original movie, Going to the Mat. Among his other production credits, Stu wrote the animated classic, The Land Before Time for producers Steven Spielberg and for George Lucas. And I'm always struck by how important this film is to the lives of our undergraduates and graduate students, many of whom have stated to us that he literally wrote their childhood. In this tender and beautiful account of a plant-eating dinosaur who was orphaned early in life, Stu gave words to the fears and aspirations of many young children whose tender connections to their kin are balanced by their desire to define themselves through journeys of discovery. In addition to The Land Before Time, Stu wrote 10 original movies for the Disney Channel, including Xenon, Girl of the 21st Century, and its two sequels, True Confessions, Smart House, uh, Phantom of the Megaplex, and Cowbells. He has been a story editor and writer on Spielberg's Amazing Stories and a supervising producer on the ABC television series, Jack's Place. He served as the head writer and story editor of the animated preschool series that I know well for my children, Toot and Poodle on Nickelodeon from 2008 to 2009. His first novel, to which we turn now, That One Cigarette, was published by Harvard Square Editions in November of 2017. His stage play, At the Pass, was produced in the spring of last year by the UCR Department of Theater, Film, and Digital Production, and it was directed by Professor Bella Merlin and presented via Zoom to an audience of more than 1,900 viewers. In April 2015, Mr. Krieger delivered a well-received TEDx talk entitled, Choose Joy. So please welcome me, enjoy, and please join me, excuse me, uh, in welcoming uh, Stu Krieger, who will read to us from his uh, counterfactual history novel that follows the lives of four families from November of 1963 to January of 2009, the book, is a tale of ordinary people generating extraordinary ripples in the ocean of life. Once again, please join me in welcoming Stu Krieger to read from his novel, That One Cigarette. Thank you, Ari. What a beautiful and, wow, overwhelming introduction. So appreciate it. Uh, all right, That One Cigarette, chapter one. It was his prized possession, the very first thing he owned that made him feel like a card-carrying adult. A 1960 Philco Predicta with a blonde wood cabinet and hi-fi speakers flanking a gleaming 21-inch picture tube. The townhouse model, the salesman down at Beckman Brothers called it. Ed Callahan loved that TV. It was tangible proof that in the league of life, he might not finish in the cellar after all. 
Ed's cue to start his morning ritual was the sound of his wife, Bonnie, clicking that television awake as she made her way to the kitchen to fix breakfast for their two kids. The calming voice of today's show anchorman, Hugh Downs, told Ed it was time to get his backside in gear. The Philco was the focal point of the couple's living room, fixing its cyclops eye on the sagging plaid couch Ed and Bonnie had inherited from her mother. Its proximity to the kitchen allowed Bonnie to listen to Hugh and newsman Frank Blair as she slapped together peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and poured bowls of sugary cereal. Already behind schedule because his bum knee begged him to refrain, remain in bed five minutes longer, Ed quickly buttoned his short sleeve white shirt and grabbed a fresh pack of unfiltered camels off his dresser. Ripping open the cellophane, he pulled out a cigarette, sparked it with his favorite lighter and hustled out buckling the skinny black belt that held up his pressed khaki slacks. One moment. Uh, sailing into the kitchen, Ed found Bonnie setting a plate of toast glistening with melted butter in front of their kids. Seven-year-old Kenny, with his hair slicked back and an orange and white striped shirt tucked into his cream-colored slacks, grabbed, gazed into his cereal bowl, mesmerized. Look, Daddy, my tricks turn the milk all pink. Isn't that neato? Bonnie corrected him. The proper word is isn't, not ain't, but son. Ed acknowledged to his, nodded to acknowledge his son, snatched a wedge of toast from the pile, and exhaled a long plume of smoke. Oh, my stars, Ed, must you smoke at the breakfast table? You know it's not good for you. I've been telling you that for ages, and now it says so right here in Time Magazine. Before Ed could respond, Bonnie plucked the latest issue, pulled it to a specific page off the counter, and moved toward him. The article had one paragraph neatly unlined, underlined in red ink. Ever the thwarted school teacher, if Bonnie had a point to make, she was going to come at you armed with indisputable facts. Meeting at the National Library of Medicine on the campus of the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, Surgeon General Luther L. Perry and his committee have been compiling evidence since late last year to support their recent findings that there's an indisputable link between chronic cigarette smoking and an alarming increase in lung cancer-related deaths, Bonnie read. Are you gonna die, Daddy? Asked 10-year-old Libby with a tremor of terror. Bonnie jumped in. No, sugar cube, Daddy is not going to die because he's gonna stop smoking right this very day, aren't you, Ed? Sure thing, or at least very soon. Ed took the percolator off the stove, grabbed a mug from the cabinet above the sink and filled it with steaming coffee. I'm serious, Bonnie said. Me too. Tell you what, Ed said, patting the pack of camels in his shirt pocket. I'll finish this pack and when it's gone, I'm done for good. With a sunburst of gratitude, Bonnie threw her arms around Ed's neck and asked if he really meant it. Hey, what's the point of all this if I won't be around to see my grandbabies? Bonnie gave Ed a passionate kiss that made Libby blush. Kenny crinkled his nose and snorted, ew, don't kiss, it's sickening. Breaking their embrace, Bonnie looked at Kenny and giggled. You should be glad we love each other. It'll only make life easier on you. Ed downed his coffee while Bonnie cleared the dishes, prodding the children to collect books and jackets. On the television in the background, Frank Blair was reporting on an erupting dispute between the Congo and the Soviet Union. Hardly paying attention, one thought skipped across Ed's mind. What the heck is the Congo? Bonnie handed her husband the sack lunch she grabbed from the refrigerator, gave him a peck on the cheek and escorted the kids out the door. While Kenny struggled into his cardigan, having trouble finding the second sleeve drooping off his shoulder, he excitedly reminded Ed he'd promised they could work on Kenny's Pinewood Derby car that evening. Ed grinned, it's a deal. Enveloped in the welcoming solitude, Ed took a last luxurious drag on a cigarette before grinding it out in the Alamo ashtray beside the toaster. Morning, Oak. He glanced up to see Marcia, his mother-in-law, shuffling into the kitchen in her pink and white checked house coat. The large pink rollers in her salt and pepper hair and the puffiness under her eyes told Ed she'd just woken up. Oak was the nickname she'd given him when he and Bonnie started dating in Ed's last year of high school. Bonnie offhandedly told her mother that what she loved most about Ed was his solid dependability and Marcia quipped, it's like having your very own oak tree. Can you, can you believe Thanksgiving's but a week away? If time flew any faster, I'd swear the world had sprouted wings. Oh, you wait and see, Ed. We'll blink and it'll be 1964. One thing Ed learned in the five years since the newly widowed Marcia moved in with them was that once she was off and running, he didn't need to respond. Marcia would blithely carry on a conversation all by herself. She grabbed a mug, filled it with coffee, and continued. Oh, big surprise. Lewis and his family are too busy to come down. I talked to him last night, long distance. He says he swamped at work and Ellen has something with her ladies auxiliary. 
although what those gals do is beyond me. Plus, apparently, Billy has a football game. Now, can that be right? Who plays high school football on Thanksgiving weekend? Ed remarked that many schools did. Marcia espoused her disapproval. Well, in any case, I thank the good Lord I have y'all to be with, or I'd be out in the street like some hobo woman, heaven forbid. Ed set his mug in the sink, grabbed his car keys off the pegboard, and told Marcia to have a good day. Lost in thought, she drifted to the Formica table and settled into the, one of the chrome chairs with its candy apple red plastic seat. As he backed out of the driveway, Ed stared at the flaky paint on their two bedroom ranch house on Jimmy D Drive. The lawn needed mowing and the flower beds needed weeding, but there were never enough hours in the day. He rolled down his window as he turned down to South Story Road. The distinct autumnal smell in the air carried Ed back to when he used to walk a similar route to school. Growing up seven or eight miles away in suburban Dallas, he planned on being a fireman until he got tackled by a sophomore grizzly bear from Waco during his senior year homecoming game, completely shattering his kneecap. The damn thing never did heal right, despite three surgeries his parents could ill afford. The army didn't want him and the fire academy couldn't take him because he lacked the necessary stamina. In the middle of one test, he had to drop 15 yards of heavy hose when his knees buckled near the top of a 12 foot ladder. And that was the end of his dream. His father didn't earn enough managing their lo local Piggly Wiggly to send Ed to college. Besides, he had no idea what he would have studied. He and school never had been a great fit. He was much more focused on girls and football than civics and mathematics. The only kind of social studies Ed cared about was learning how to convince Bonnie Lee Bismarck to date him. After high school, Ed worked as a delivery boy at his uncle's pizza parlor, quickly getting promoted to manager. He somehow saved enough to buy Bonnie a tiny diamond ring and asked her to marry him on his 21st birthday. Five weeks after their small wedding at his father's elk lodge, Bonnie told Ed she was pregnant. Libby was born in 1953 and Kenny came along three years later. They knew they couldn't stay in their tiny one bedroom apartment, but even with Bonnie working the evening shift at Skillern's drugstore four nights a week, they couldn't foresee any way they'd ever be able to afford a house. Ed was working for a company that filled book orders for schools statewide. After 18 months, he'd worked his way up to assistant warehouse manager, was, but was still only making $2.75 an hour. And then Bonnie's father dropped dead. The poor bastard was only 51 years old when a massive heart attack knocked him to the showroom floor at Patio World, just as he was about to close a sale on a six-piece white wicker ensemble with cobalt cushions. Marcia dove into a spiraling panic. She had no marketable skills, she had never worked outside the home, and Lloyd had somehow forgotten to keep up with their life insurance payments. The only thing Marcia owned was her compact little house on Bowman Street, but she was terrified of living there alone. That was how the Callahans came to buy their house. Marcia sold her place, gave a healthy chunk to Bonnie, of the cash to Bonnie and Ed as their down payment, and took up residence with them. It meant she'd share a bedroom with her grandkids, but Marcia didn't mind. She felt she could handle almost anything as long as she didn't have to navigate life alone. Despite repeated declarations that she was ruining their lives, Ed and Bonnie did all they could to reassure Marcia that she was a welcome and helpful presence in their home. Now they'd been in the house nearly five years. Kenny was a Cub Scout. Libby took tap dancing lessons at the community center. One of the kids' most beloved rituals was to be bathed in their pajamas by 8 p.m. on Thursday nights so they could watch the Flintstones before Marsha hustled them off to bed while Bonnie was at work. Ed still felt an electric twinge in his crotch when he thought about Bonnie. They'd been together since high school, married for 11 years, but he felt great pride, not to mention a modicum of awe in the fact that she was his wife. Sometimes during a quiet night at home, he'd look up to find her mending the kids' socks or cutting coupons from the Times Herald, her dirty blonde ponytail fastened by her favorite plastic Scotty dog hair clip and he'd wonder what she saw in him. Reflecting on his radar dish ears and slightly bucked front teeth, Ed thought she definitely could have done better for herself. He only hoped she never figured that out. Back at the house, Bonnie filled the sink with hot water and busied herself doing the dishes as Marcia glanced at the morning paper. President's coming to town, she said. Jackie too. Ah, that dear girl, dear girl has more style than Grace Kelly and Oleg Cassini combined. As his 56 Ford Fairlane glided along the freeway, Ed pulled a camel from his shirt pocket, punched the dashboard lighter, and waited for the cylinder to heat up. Sticking the cigarette between his lips, he heard the lighter's familiar pop and plucked it out. 
with its neat concentric circles glowing a deep orange, Ed pressed the filament to the end of what Bonnie sneeringly referred to as his coffin nail. He reveled in a deep inhale. The instant he sucked the smoke down his lungs, he felt that euphoric rush of nicotine that never failed to be delivered. He knew it was a filthy habit, but quitting wasn't gonna be easy. He'd been smoking since he was 16 and loved the ritual, the comfort. After taking that final drag, he'd grind the butt out on his boot heel, feeling like a real man. After Ed pulled himself out of his daydreams and swerved across two lanes to the off-ramp, he headed for the book depository parking lot. He heard an unsettling scraping behind him and knew it was the tailpipe drag dragging. The wire he'd rigged to hold it up must have broken when he veered to catch the ramp. Ed glanced at his watch. It was 7.56 a.m. No time to deal with the tailpipe now. He couldn't afford to be late. His boss, Roy Truly, was a decent man who seemed to like Ed, but with 19 warehouse men to manage, Roy liked to keep things running ship shape. Ed pulled into his regular parking spot parallel to the chain link fence. His coworker, Junior Jarman, was arriving in his Chevy station wagon. Ed snatched his sack lunch off the passenger seat and hopped out. Hey, morning, Junior. How they hanging? Tight and to the right, just the way I like them. Both men chuckled. Junior was clutching a black metal lunch bucket with a union decal on the butt end. That thing had more miles on it than a 51 Dodge. Junior had been working at the book depository on and off for years. He and Ed never socialized outside of the job, but they were friendly enough at work. They ate together once or twice a week in the second floor lunchroom or met in the domino room to play a quick game of bones as they gobbled their sandwiches and guzzled Dr. Peppers. The two men left the parking lot, crossing several sets of railroad tracks. Ed made a point to stop and look around the boxcars to ensure no oncoming train mowed them down. Seen the morning paper, Junior asked. President's motorcade gonna pass right on by just after noon tomorrow. If we time it right, we're apt to get a look at him on the lunch break. Of course, I ain't been too crazy about the man since he nearly got us into World War III over that showdown with the Ruskies. The Cuban missile thing? Ed asked. Heck, Junior, he did what needed to be done. Otherwise, that maniac Khrushchev would have bombed us to kingdom come. Looks like it'll be one hell of a procession. Johnson, Governor Conley, Mrs. Kennedy too, I do believe. Going by us on the way to some fancy VIP luncheon at the trade mart. You know, it must be nice flying around on private jets, riding in limousines, having folks cheer you just for showing up. It all looks like a giant pain in the butt, if you ask me, Ed said. You can't belch without it turning in the front page news. Minutes later, Ed and Junior moved past the loading dock and slipped through the rear door of the Texas School Book Depository. Heading for the basement stairs, Ed spied Roy Truly hustling across the plywood planks lining the first floor. Ed offered a good morning and a chipper wave. Roy grinned and nodded at Ed and Junior in return. Ed stuck his lunch in the basement locker and hung up his corduroy jacket. Junior was at his own cupboard a few feet down. Closing his locker door, Ed turned and nearly collided with a skinny, pale fellow he knew only as Lee. Seven or eight years younger than Ed, Lee had only been working at the depository for about a month. He always seemed to move without making a sound. Sorry, Ed said as he sidestepped the newcomer. Lee nodded, remaining silent. Ed could see the yellow stains in the armpit of Lee's once white Fruit of the Loom t-shirt that was now the color of an exhausted Brillo pad. The younger man swiftly moved up the steps and disappeared. Ed shook his head and chuckled as he turned toward Junior. Geez, even on our crummy salary, you'd think that kid could spring for a clean t-shirt. End of chapter one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Stu. I am um, wanting to join you here. That, that last line is so chilling. Um, uh, all right, here, here I am. I'm joining you now. Um, <laughs> that la last line, you know, I've, re I've read this account a couple of times, but this is the first time I've heard it read through your voice with the voices of all of the characters animated the read. And I have to tell you, it's, it's a wonderful um, experience to get to hear it from the, the writer's own, uh, you know, to hear the writer's own words through their own voice. So thank you for that. And I want to remind everybody that um, if you have questions or responses, now is a good time to put them into the chat. Remember, we're not going to have a Q&A. We're going to use your questions. I'm going to read through the chat and, um, and read the questions that you send through the chat box. So I do invite you to do that. But to get us start us off, started off, I wonder, Stu, if I could ask you, um, if you would tell us a little bit about what inspired this story. 
Yeah, it began actually out of conversations I was having with several of our students at UCR coming in during office hours. And especially the kids that were about to graduate were constantly talking about how do I begin my career? But at the same time, I really want to make a difference. I want to have an impact. I want to make sure my work is going to resonate. What do I do? And, you know, drawing from my own life and experiences, one of the things I was thinking about that we very seldom know the influence we're having and the impact we're making in the moment. And so a lot of the start of the what if thought was, you know, starting with ordinary people in ordinary places, what are those things that sometimes we might not even realize until much later, or if ever, that this little tiny decision we made influenced that thing that changed that thing that, as the book says, you know, had ripples throughout the world. And that was kind of the springboard. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I wanted to ask you, I know that there are some questions coming in, but before we turn to questions also from the floor, can I ask you to share with us, I know we have a lot of writers in the room. Um, can I ask you to share a little bit about your process of writing? Do you have a routine, for example, like daily writing? Uh, do you have rituals? I mean, sometimes there's a mystique that there's a writing muse and people are just inspired and, you know, all the hard work is sort of pushed aside. So would you share with us some of your process? Yeah, many of my students have often heard me say when they'll ask, you know, during the course of your 30 year film and television career, how did you deal with writer's block? And my kind of flippant answer that has a very deep truth underneath it is I was always, always say, I never had writer's block, I had a mortgage. And by <laughs> that, what I meant was I was an incredibly disciplined writer. I always, almost most of my career, except was a, when I was on a TV staff, worked at home. But I always, wherever we lived, had an office that was my dedicated writing space. And even when my kids were little, you know, the word around the house was, if daddy's in the box, leave him alone, he's working. Um, and so I would be in the office by 9.30 every morning. I worked until 12.30 or 1. I would take an hour lunch break and usually take a walk or go out to lunch somewhere just to get other input and stimulus and then come back and work from 1.30 to 5 o'clock. And, you know, with the book, it was a little bit different because I was already a full-time professor. And then as you well know, having been there, um, about two years into the writing process, inherited the chairship of our department. And so during that period, I knew rather than frustrate myself, I just put the book aside and get back to it when I could. And so, you know, that was another instructive thing for our students, ultimately from first day of writing till publishing was a seven year process. But part of the joy for me was in my film and television career, everything was always to a deadline and a very specific page count and it was, you know, you're writing this Disney Channel movie. We needed a week from Friday. We needed to be 90 pages. Go. And so with the book, I really decided it'll be done when it's done. It will be as long as it is. We'll see. And then the first draft was over 500 pages. And so much of the last year was just, as, again, as my students know, killing the babies and getting rid of the darlings and subplots that weren't really advancing the narrative. And that, you know, so like I said, the whole first, final year of the process was editing and honing and getting it down to the book it became. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our colleague Donatella Galella has um, put in a comment about how riveting the read was to her and how she admires the way you interweave the imaginative stories and histories and characters. So let me um, ask you, uh, spinning off of Donatella's question, comment, um, Ed is very connected to his family and we soon meet his wife, his mother-in-law and other characters. This is a book that's set against great political changes. I mean, and here we are again in life, <laughs> meeting with great political changes. And yet there's also a core anchoring um, in the American family and later in the book in families of people around the world. Um, why did you write or choose to write a historical counterfactual book that also focuses on families? Yeah, a lot of that again goes back to the premise of you know, ordinary people making extraordinary decisions. And, you know, as you know, I am a family guy. Um, I am also a writer who really works from character. And so for me, it's always about who are the people I want to write about? Where are they? What are their situations? And, you know, I was a bit of a freaky little kid in terms of from the time I was about 11 years old, I was like some Woody Allen character and that I was obsessed with the Kennedy assassination. And so when I had, you know, first started to work out more of the skeleton of the book, it was like, I knew that that was the first event I wanted to play around with. And so it was thinking about who would this family in Dallas be? What would the situation, you know, that could plug them into 
the events that happened be. And in doing my very early research, that quote about Bonnie reading from the Time Magazine actually did come out in November of 1963. And so when I saw that, it was like, ooh, you know, what if it was a guy trying to quit smoking who happened to work at the book depository? And I don't want to go into a whole lot of spoiler alerts, but, but suffice to say, you know, Ed's decision to quit smoking ends him in proximity to, to Lee later on in the day we finished reading in chapter one that, you know, changes the course of history because of that. So it was, you know, anchoring it in these families and these everyday people in situations that I cared about. And kind of even in the book club, I mean, we always talk about, they'll say it's Stu's rule. And Stu's rule is, if I don't care about the characters, I can't care about the story. Nice. Thank you for that. Um, Clyde Derrick has a question. He's asking if you're planning on writing a sequel to your book. No. <laughs> uh, I actually am working on a brand new novel with a completely different direction and tone and shape and like kind of 180 degrees away from this book. But I really feel like the, you know, the story of these guys has been told and I, I was quite pleased with where we got to by the end and feel like they're good. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Charlotte is just remarking on the descriptions of the decor, you know, the, the 50s and 60s descriptions um, that are coming through and the textures, the candy apple uh, seats come to mind, they jump at me uh, every time. Was that, uh, did you work off of photographs or anything, uh, just memory? Well, the beautiful thing is it was a combo of all of the above. Um, but one of the great things to all of my colleagues and anybody else from UCR is the very first year I employed two UCR grad students as my research assistants because I couldn't imagine doing this book if it wasn't in the time of the internet because there's details that you'll see if you read the full novel of, you know, down the line, what football game Ed was watching on a September morning in 1965. And I could Google, you know, who did the Cowboys play that season? What was their game on Sunday, September 23rd, 1965? And, find the information. But what I did with the research assistants that was so great is, you know, there's chapters that take place during the Vietnam War, there's stuff during the 9-11 crisis. It really trickles from 1963 to 2009. And with the research assistants, I would give them things like, I need a battle in Vietnam. It has to be in the spring of 1965. It has to take place in this general region. But the idea is it was an ambush that ended up in, in a massacre. Find me a couple battles that would be, you know, would fit that description. And so they would do stuff like that. They would also bring me pictures of some of the things you were talking about. But then a lot of the specifics, especially, you know, like I said, I was a kid in the 60s. So a lot of those things were really fun memories to pull up and pull back. But then I also did when there's the, the description of Kenny in his cream colored slacks and his striped t-shirt, I mean shirt, uh, I looked at my first grade picture and that's what I was wearing <laughs> in that first grade picture when I was Kenny's age. So that was, <laughs> you know, so I was pulling from everywhere I possibly could mm -hmm. and putting it all together. Hmm. I guess you have to be very receptive to all of those cues when you're in that creative uh, uh, mode. Um, David Duane has a, a question and he, he notes that the minimum action required to change the course of history has been explored by various authors. Are there any authors um, or the way that they develop alternative reality theme that you consider noteworthy or that influenced your own work? What was interesting, David, is I actually went, I used other authors to go the opposite direction. And again, if you read the whole book, you'll see that some of the events of our history did not change. And most of the alternate history books I was reading in preparation were all about the butterfly effect of this one small thing. Everything changes, everything is different. You know, all our history bends a different way. And I'm a believer that certain things and certain relationships are faded no matter what the circumstances are. And, you know, my wife of 39 years and I will often talk about, we think that if we didn't meet where we met, we would have met somewhere because it was meant to be. And so part of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to play around with something I hadn't seen previously was this idea that in my book, some things are faded and are gonna happen no matter what ripples and changes. And one of the fun things in plotting the whole book out was there's times when it'll be a giant right-hand turn that somehow dovetails right back and at some point links back up to our history and our experiences. And that was, you know, one of the joys of plotting it, of having those two things to play with rather than straight up butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. 
our colleague Bella Merlin has a playful question that she's offering. Um, she knows that several presidents feature in the novel. Uh, does the current political situation texture uh, your reading of your own novel as you encounter it uh, again, having written two years ago? Um, what would your imaginative what ifs be now? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be very, very careful here because we have a wide audience. Uh, but it's interesting that the title of the today's event, the what if, was not something I came up with. That was through the library folks. And that very question is something I have been asking myself pretty much every hour of every day in the last four years, the what if. Um, so back to the earlier question, the only reason I would possibly write a sequel to the book is if I could what if away the last four years. And I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, Sandra, Sandra Balthazar Martinez is, is weighing in and asking about the setting and thinking about how you came up with the setting. And she's remarking on the Piggly Wiggly uh, <laughs> as a store in, in the southern U.S. Um, yeah. Yes. So one of the things once I determined kind of, I knew I wanted to have four families intersecting and I knew that I wanted each of them to do something that had a major influence on the bend and arc of our history. And so it was almost like once I decided that I was gonna start with Ed's family and the Kennedy assassination, then it was jumping to what events were of interest to me to kind of play around with. And then again, constructing who would be the right family in the right place to have the right influence. And so, um, you know, obviously with the Callahan's, Dallas was the logical setting because I wanted him to work at the book depository. And then this was another part of the research. I knew Piggly Wiggly stories from trips to Florida, but then I had to research, are they also in Dallas? And the answer was yes. And even the Beckman Brothers Furniture Store that we re uh, referenced was a real place. And Roy Truly, the manager that I referenced working at the depository was the manager during the time of the Kennedy assassination. So that was the other really fun things of weaving in actual settings, actual places and actual characters to our fictional narrative. And so then with the settings for the other three families, those were all connected to, if I need somebody that's gonna be integrally involved in this event, I need them to start here so I can get them where I need them to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stu. And I just wanna thank all of the people who keep um, coming up with wonderful questions. And I wanna encourage you to, uh, to ask some more. It's nice to see another familiar name here. Jennifer Ozels um, asks, do you ever struggle with opening lines? And relatedly, do you begin at the beginning or do you write out of order? Uh, two parts. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am an incredibly anal retentive human being and writer. Um, so I always have to write chronologically. Uh, there, I am constantly, when I'm writing, jotting notes like crazy. And so I have, you know, any time that I'm writing in a Word document, there's a separate Word document beside me so that when ideas and inspirations are, ooh, ooh, later I could do this, that I keep those notes going. But in terms of writing actual scenes and actual moment, I kind of have to go chronologically because it's the way my brain works. And especially with a book like this that was so much about this event causes this event that leads to that event. I really wouldn't know how to do it out of sequence. Um, and then in terms of the opening, Jennifer, yes. The answer is yes. The answer is yes a hundred times, which is if I went through various drafts, I think there was 15 different openings for the book, even you know in the moment, let alone the opening line. And then it was really the more I came to know Ed, the more I came to understand him and his place in the world and his insecurities, you know, when he's talking in the first chapter about he's afraid Bonnie's going to wake up one day and realize she could have done better than him. And, you know, those kind of references, it was thinking about, you know, he's a guy that wants to know that he's not a failure, that he's going to be okay, that even if he doesn't have this incredibly thriving, prestigious career, he's making a go of it and he's supporting his family. And so then it was, in, I don't remember whose research whether it was mine or one of the research assistants, but I saw a picture of that television with the blonde wood cabinet and, you know, when they used to be these big pieces of furniture in your living room. And then that's kind of when I hit on that image was like, oh, that's the thing I want to start with because it defines Ed as I need this tangible symbol of I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, Jennifer's question makes me think, we, we have an MFA in writing for creative writing and writing for the performing arts where students choose two different genres. 
it, um, it occurs to me, you know, you've written so much for film and television, and here we have a novel. Um, did the writing, the years of writing television and uh, for television and, and producing for television and film, did that um, influence your methodology of writing? You talked about this methodical way in which every, you know, you, you kind of have to write chronologically and have the separate book for ideas. Was there a cross uh, fertilization between uh, those different media you have worked in? Actually, it was a little bit the converse of the hardest thing for me because screen and television writing is so dependent on dialogue. Uh, that was one of the things that when it went to the publisher for the first time, they were like, damn, there's a lot of dialogue here. Uh, you know, you might want to thin some of it out. And, and similarly, when I was saying earlier about, you know, needing to kill some of the darlings and part of the problem was there were certain conversations where I would think, oh my God, that line's hilarious, but it really only works as dialogue because it's, particular to that character and their way of speaking and their way of referencing the world. Some of them I had to lose, some of them I kind of had to learn how, you know, is there a way I can craft that into the prose? Um, but that was the biggest challenge of not being so reliant on dialogue. But in terms of the actual process itself, <coughs> excuse me, it really was years of discipline of the actual writing. And, and I also feel like I'm very fortunate that I'm a writer who loves to write. And it was always so interesting to me over my film and television career that I was in a writer's poker game for years and half of every poker game was the writers bitching about, isn't it just torture? And you know, how do you drag yourself to the chair? And how do you sit down and actually write? And oh my God, I want to kill myself. And I was like, really? Because I think it's really fun. And, and I've, I've said in class before that you know, my best days were always where I would just get so lost in the story. I would look up at the clock and it was one o'clock in the afternoon. I'd go, wait a minute. You know, last time I knew it was 9.30, what happened? <laughs> Thank you. Um, back to Clyde, had, uh, again, with a, with a great question about which screenwriters and fiction writers have inspired you. Again, uh, I'm really a character guy, as I said. So people like John Irving, who are a little bit quirky, and you know, the characters are really distinct and really individual. And, you know, his books like A Prayer for Owen Meany and The World According to Garp, those are really influential to me. And then similarly, uh, you know, with films, it's I am so much more connected to movies like The Fabulous Baker Boys by Steve Plovis, which is a character-driven story of two brothers and a chanteuse who threatens to come between them. Um, so I'm always, you know, I don't care about superhero movies. I don't care about heavy plot-driven action movies. It's, you know, back to the theme of who are these people? Why do I care? And why do I want to spend time with them? And those are always both the authors and the filmmakers that I gravitate toward. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a follow-up question from Donna Lawton who asks if you used Stephen King's novel, um, November 22nd and, and 1963 or, or 11, 22, 63 in any of your research. Uh, no, this, this is one of those things that every one of you who ever aspires to be a writer will have the moment of, um, oh, expletive when you see something, so I was already three years into writing the book when I saw a press release on this book. And it was a, you know, a moment of, is he gonna totally blow me out of the tub in terms of, are we writing the same story? And you know, I'm kind of thinking if folks have a choice of the Stephen King novel or the Stu Krieger version, where are they going? So you, know, you always have those moments of, I thought I was being so original and clever. So I did something that I highly recommend, which is my son is a brilliant writer and filmmaker as well, and a Stephen King fanatic. So as soon as I saw the press release, I said, your job's gonna be to read the book and tell me if I got any problems here. I don't wanna read it because I don't want it to influence me. I don't want it to have any impact. And he finished reading and said, you're good. He went in a completely different direction with a completely different story. It's the only thing in common is the fact that the JFK you know, assassination is featured, but um, again, you know, no spoiler alerts, but that part of my book is over in the first 25 or 30 pages and then everything goes from there. So I just always feel it's wiser if there's something even remotely in the world of what you're doing, just stay away from it and then you don't have that subliminal influence and get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Good. And we have some, some of our students who are writing here and, and, you know, for us, it's also a chance to see you again. So I, 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 I know that Stu and I, we both feel so delighted to see familiar uh, names coming up in the chat box. Thank you all for being here. Jeffrey Ramos uh, has a wonderful question. How is the process of picking the names? What's your process for picking the names of the characters? 
uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, you will always find at least five or six, if not more characters in anything I write that are people from my real life. Um, years and years ago, when I wrote my first episode of Amazing Stories for Steven Spielberg, it was an episode that starred Mark Hamill and every single character in it was named for somebody I went to high school with. <laughs> and, you know, like the bully was the high school bully, the gym teacher was the, you know, every, everybody was somebody I went to high school with. And my favorite thing was the next morning, the Rochester Times Union newspaper called me and they said, did you write the episode of Amazing Stories that aired last night? And I said, yeah. And they said, several people called us and said, uh, will you research if Stu Krieger wrote the episode because everybody was somebody from Brighton High School that we went to school with. And I know he's in Hollywood writing. I want to see if it was his show. And it was. Uh, so that's always really fun. It's another really also great way to get revenge. You know, Leonard Skinner, the band, is named for their high school gym teacher who tortured them. And they, you know, changed the spelling of his name and named the band so that they could tell the world that he was the gym teacher that tortured them. Um, so I have done that over the years. Uh, there's a character, well, no, I won't go there because <laughs> then I might get busted, but there's characters, <laughs> you know, that have been named for people that tormented me over the years. And sometimes I'll change the last name, but keep the first name or vice versa. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes names will change as I get to know the characters more. And then another incredibly practical consideration in this particular book is there's a Muslim family in Baghdad. And again, not wanting to presume I knew things I didn't know. When I had those chapters done, I had a Muslim consultant who I worked with who was a, a writer and a really smart guy who I just said, you know, I need your input to help me vet the authenticity of this and if there's anything I said that you know doesn't ring true or is in any way offensive please help me and one of the things that he did was there's a couple of the characters names where he said these are Muslim names but they're not Iraqi names they're not a name you would find in Baghdad you more have to find them you know and then he would cite a different part of the world and then he would give me alternatives of here's four or five names that are similar and come from the same route but it would be more you know likely to end up in the region of the world you're writing about. Mm -hmm. So since you spoke a little bit about the autobiographical elements that come into the book here, um, can I ask you, you, you begin the story and we heard you write and, and read your writing about Ed. Um, and Ed is such a relatable character, I think, to begin with, <coughs> who then uh, opens up to all these other characters who are going to be uh, taken from the global uh, world. To me, when I was reading it, and as I said, I've read it now several times, in some way, Ed reminds me of you. But I, this dilemma with smoking, can you tell us a little bit more about this dilemma of, with smoking? Is it, is it an autobiographical? Is it a historical? I mean, it is a sea change in terms of our attitudes towards smoking. Yeah. Uh, no, I was never a smoker in my <laughs> life. Um, both of my parents were. My father had incredible heart disease that was largely linked to the fact that he smoked three packs a day for several years. Uh, so to me and my brothers, it was always disgusting, and we never wanted anything to do with it. Um, but the device, like I said, that really came when I linked the two pieces of history of, you know, the Surgeon General's report and needing something that was going to be the trigger to get Ed where he needed to be, which ultimately, again, I don't think I'm spoiling too much, but, you know, ultimately gets him to the sixth floor of the book depository on that faithful day. And so, you know, I think you had remarked initially when you read the book about the description of inhaling the smoke down into his lungs and the euphoria that followed. And, and you were saying, if you were never a smoker, how did you know that? And it's one of those things, again, ask questions, talk to people. And, you know, again, because both of my parents were such chronic smokers for many decades, I remember watching that, you know, I, you, it was something you could actually physically see on their faces when they were inhaling and having that rush and then exhaling and all the rest of it. Um, so it's kind of use, as writers, use every single resource you possibly have. You know, ask questions, keep notes, keep files. It's all going to be fodder for something someday. Mm -hmm. Well, um, speaking about notes and, and, and um, uh, creative stimulations, the, the book begins with a quote um, by Robert Kennedy, uh, inspired by George Bernard Shaw. Uh, the quote is, some men see things as they are and say, why? Uh, I dream things that um, never were and say, why not? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration to start the book with that quote? Yeah. In my thesis of, you know, we all have the ability to make a difference in our lives and in our world if we're present 
in our own lives and if we're paying attention to those opportunities and when they do arise. And what I loved about the quote was this idea of taking an active course of action, taking, making the decision to rather than sit and bitch and moan and if only and why couldn't and could we ever and you think maybe kind of decisions that people make. It's speaking to this idea that I'm seeing things that aren't right and I'm looking to how do we change it? How do we make it better? How do we you know, have that influence? Mm -hmm. um, while you formulate the next question, I'm going to jump up real quick and close the shade because I've been uh, yes, yes, no washing me out. I'll be right back. No problem. And I'm, I'm sorry about the canine interference with our sound here. But I again want to encourage people who, who may have more questions because we do have a little more time. Um, please feel free to, to uh, embed your questions. The questions have been wonderful in the chat. It's been wonderful to see who's, who's here and who's present with us. Um, so as you're adjusting back, I will, I will ask you another question. And this has to do with um, the, the counterfactual uh, history novel as a label. Um, yeah. you, you, you speak about this as a counterfactual uh, historical novel or history novel. Can yeah. you tell us about uh, what that means and what that means to you and why you chose to use this mode to tell the story? Yeah, it was actually my publisher who pointed out that term. I had never heard that. I'd, you know, heard alternate fiction and butterfly effect novels and all that. Um, and what they explained and what made total sense for this book is counterfactual novels really are based on the premise of what if. And so as opposed to the butterfly effect novels, you know, like I said earlier, make the one change and then ripple, ripple, here we go. The what if is what if this one thing changed, what would be the positives and negatives and pluses and minuses and things, like I said, with the fate of, you know, what does change and what does not. And so it's a term directly linked to the idea of asking the what if questions. Mm -hmm. And that really is, you know, in the subsequent chapters with the subsequent families, each of them have that moment or something they couldn't possibly have foreseen. And, and one of the things that was really fun is because of the chronological nature of the book, you know, we meet each of the four families in 1963 and then pick them back up in 1965. And there's all these chronological jumps forward but each jump is bringing us to the precipice of that next event that influences one of the members of one of the families to make a choice that then not only ripples through the other families, but through the larger fabric of our society. Mm -hmm. I could see coming back to one of the questions that were, was always already asked about a, a sequel. Um, I could see that question because you, you, you end the book um, at 2009, right? As a, as a time. Um, why, why end it there? I mean, I know you were writing some years after that um, and want to speak to that. Yeah, it, it was the final event, which again, I, <laughs> I know, I know without giving, this is a little yeah, awkward. Yeah. What I would like not to go through, but, that final event allowed the fourth family to make their impact. And so it really was that now it's done in terms of each of them did the thing. And, and one of the things you'll also see if you read the full book is that each one of those changes allowed the next change to happen. Had that previous change not happened, the character either may no longer have been alive or might not have been in the right place at the right time. And so that was part of the challenge once I, once I kind of had the bare bones framework composed, then it was like, okay, now how do I make sure each of these things really line up in the right way? And what's interesting about, you know, writing being rewriting, one of the pivotal things that led to the final 2009 resolution for the fourth family was a really, really late discovery. I had a piece missing. And this is something I also talk to my students about often. I'll say, when you have those pieces missing, just stick a placeholder there rather than get bogged down and say, I know this still has to be figured out, but I'm going to move past it and, you know, keep going forward. And I was really far down the process when it, I just kept going, no, that, you know, it's not lining up properly. That piece is still missing. <clears throat> and then I don't even remember the why of it, but there was a morning of, oh my God, I know what that is. That's what I need. To, and then I had to work backwards and plug it in and adjust moving forward. Hmm discoveries are something so wonderful again about the creative process i know when we're talking about theater making we're often talking about keeping things alive so you can discover in the moment and it's so wonderful to hear that that was part of your process in writing this um sandra is also asking if you can uh, uh he's she's she's inviting you to take us into your brilliant mind again and tell us the top two to three differences in writing a film script versus writing a novel thank sure. you great question uh, 
I am quite sure my students will go, yeah, yeah, we know. Um, but one of the things I always say to them in our very first workshop every quarter is the big difference about writing film and television versus prose is film is a visual medium. And so you don't need to tell me, you need to show me. And again, all of my students who are here today will know that when they, when they get an S-I-T-N uh, note from me, I mean, save it for the novel. Um, and that's a note where, you know, suddenly in a screenplay, you'll get this beautiful description about the character's interior monologue. And I'll say to the students, you know, if you're telling me 25 years ago today, her mother passed away and that mournful look on her life is reflecting the fact that she's thinking back on this wonderful man. I go, get up and act that for me. And if you can do that, it can stay in the screenplay. You know, if you can't save it for the novel, because you can have those beautiful passages and, you know, descriptive moments. And like we said, some of the things about describing the decor in Ed's home and all the rest of it is totally appropriate in the novel. Whereas the screenplay, I'll always say to them, great thought, great moment, something that's important to your story. Now, how do we take that and make it active and visual and put it on, on its feet? Because if there's things in the screenplay that your reader is gonna know, but your watcher is never gonna know, it's gotta go. And so, yeah. you know, you're telling me something that's only interior, how do we make it exterior? And then, so one of the joys of, and, and kind of learning to flex the different muscle of writing the novel then, was, oh, I can take some time here. I can spend, if I need to, a full page talking about all the interior emotions that is going through when he realizes, you know, this moment of potential, you know, pivotal changes in front of him. I can slow it down. I can go inside his head. I can think about all of those things that he's considering in a flash before he makes the move he makes. And in the screenplay, just show me. Hmm. So along those lines, what was, you know, having, having written so much, what was the scariest thing about saying to yourself, I'm going to write a novel, and, and maybe if I can link it, what was the most joyful discovery you made about the process of writing a novel? Um, the scariest thing was, who the hell do you think you are? Kind of, you, know, <laughs> you got no credibility, you got no bona fides, where do you think you're going with this, buddy? Settle down. Um, and then it also, I, I remember this really, really distinctly. Um, because once I, I had worked with an editor before I ever got the publisher, and then once I got the publisher, I made two passes with their notes and input. And I re <clears throat> remember sitting in front of the computer, composing the email, and, and about to hit send of the final version of the manuscript. And it was another moment of terror. And part of it was like, you know, is it done? Is it ready? What am I thinking? I'm an idiot. Now it's going out to the world, and I can't you know, <laughs> pull it back in again. Um, so it was that the two moments of you know, the terror to begin and then the terror to hit send to send it to the publisher. Um, and I think the joy of it, again, is I am a joyous writer. And so there were days where it was just all my friends, you know, when I had to take some time away because of the teaching responsibilities and I'd come back to it and I was like, oh, I like these guys. I'm happy to be back with them. I'm happy, you know, to be reunited with Ed and Bonnie and Gina and the other characters. And, and there was a time you know, about a year after I published it, where some, somebody asked me a question and I couldn't remember. And I sat down with the book and I was flipping through and it was like, oh yeah, these guys, you know? And it really was, like you said, reconnecting with old friends and, and that's tons of fun. That's wonderful. Did, did writing the novel influence the way you teach? Because we are in a multi-genre kind of program. Yeah, I think every experience we have in the real world is a humbling and instructive thing to bring back to our pedagogy. And for me, it's just, you know, learning about, it never gets easier, it never, you know, there's always things to learn. Um, you know, I say to my students all the time in workshop, I learn as much from you as you learn from me, and I really mean that. And so it's, the beauty of writers is we can be writing. And so, you know, I have never had an experience, whether it was film and TV or the novel, where I didn't feel I learned a tremendous amount just by doing it and seeing what worked and seeing what people respond to. And, you know, one of the great joys for me when the book was reviewed, both professionally and then on Amazon, and I'll take a moment to gripe as well. The, the beautiful thing was the last time I looked, there are 50 reviews on Amazon and 49 of them are incredibly positive. And there's one negative and that's the one that comes up first. 
it's like, wait a minute, there's, just, <laughs> there's something about this algorithm that ain't right. <laughs> um, but anyway, I was gonna say one of the things that was unexpectedly rewarding is one of the reviewers on Amazon talked about that they said, I was very surprised by the depth and dimension of the female characters in this book. And there's many different women with many different, you know, aspects and qualities and points of view. And they said, it just very much surprised me from a male writer that there was such diverse points of view of the women characters in the book. And it was such a wonderful compliment and a great triumph for me because again, it's something I worked really hard to make these people authentic and genuine and not stereotypical and three dimensional and surprising. And so that was a particularly very joyful and rewarding review to get. <laughs> Uh, I felt it too as a as a woman reading your novel. Um, I, I I'm going to uh, turn now to Bella Merlin's question, and we're going to make this the, the our final question as we're nearing our our the la our last moments together. So Bella observes that there's a very intimate connection between the novelist and reader, which is different uh, from writing for television and screen with directors, directors of photography, actors, etc. So between you and the audience, she's asking, what is your relationship with the reader when you're writing? Yeah, it's really thinking about <laughs> what is the relatability here? What is the thing I'm hoping my readers will take away from it? It kind of goes back to the thing I was saying earlier about, because I am a writer who focuses on character, you know, why is this an interesting person in the ensemble? Who will relate to this? Who will care about this? If it's somebody out of my own experience, how do I continue to try to make them accessible? And one of the great joys of the novel process versus you know, being a film and screenwriter for the reason Bella cites is film is such a collaborative medium. And no matter what, even for the most accomplished screenwriters, there's a million people that continue to have input and it's studio executives and producers and directors and ultimately actors and all the rest of it. And so to have, it was a double-edged sword of both there's not anybody else to blame you know, if the book lands with a thud. But at the same time, it's really fun not to have to answer to 100 different masters and just kind of ultimately trust that voice and trust, you know, feeling like I think this is the book I want to put out there. Well, Stu, I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing your book with us and sharing your thoughts about writing this novel and also writing in general and the creative process. I wanna also thank all of the wonderful participants for your um, terrific questions, really. And I wanna invite uh, Janine McBride to say a few words in closing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Stu and Amy, for leaving us in that great conversation. So as was stated earlier, the replay will be available within 48 hours on the UCR Library's website. Please, everyone, make sure that you bookmark the UCR Library website to find out more information for featured speakers in this series during the 2021 calendar year. Also, make sure that you follow us on all of our social media pages. That's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Now, if you enjoyed this event and you would like to continue to support events like these and other library activities, please visit our giving page to find out different ways that you can contribute. Thank you all once again for joining us and have a great rest of your evening.